Well, in the last episode, we had some people who were a bit concerned about coming here because of the tides, rips, overfalls, and the weather. Honestly, there's nothing to worry about. You'll have a great time. Okay, the sailing's a bit of a challenge, but that's what it's all about. Hello everybody and welcome back to the second of our where we learned our lessons the hard way set of videos. <laughs> uh, this one is concentrating on Northern Ireland and the Southern Hebrides. Uh, there's a link up here to last week's which deals with um, England, Wales, the Isle of Man and parts of Southern Scotland, basically the Irish Sea area. So once again we're going to do it in reverse order of what gave us the most collie wobbles and just basically tell you what we uh, we did. Hmm. So we'll start off with number 10 <laughs> and that's the Burnt Dials up the top of the Cals of Butte. Now it was actually a very easy passage. <laughs> I mean we just went Ooh, and we were through it. Uh, but the pilot just scared the pants off us. The, 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 the channel looked so narrow and we'd talked to some other people and said you've got to be tricky, go, it's, yeah, it's got to be careful going through that. Um, it is a narrow channel. Of all the channels that we've ever been through, it is by far and away the narrowest. Um, so, it was like you know, two or three boat widths, wasn't it? Yeah. So you can have a lot of issues purely because you've got a lot of water going through it. A very narrow channel. But as you can see here in this footage, it is very, very skinny. It's, <laughs> it's by far and away narrow. <laughs> very narrow. Um, but you know going through at slack that is i think the main thing you have to do with all of these places is find out when slack is and go then yeah don't try and go through at the top of the time oh, the run of the tide no because you know if you're barreling through there then you know you've not got much room to maneuver and when you're in these areas when you're going through barreling because we've barrowed through quite a few gaps um, you haven't got as much control over your boat. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why it can be in there yeah. as a problem. Yeah. And tides can be deceptive because of, well, it just can because of local geography, because that brings us very neatly to number nine the Gobbins, just south of the Isle of Muck and Isle of McGee, the entrance to Belfast Lock. And it looks innocuous. I mean, you look at it on the chart and you think, what could possibly go wrong there? And the answer is, it has a countercurrent that as Belfast lock, um, the tide moves in and out, you get a countercurrent that just runs up past Blackhead Lighthouse, just up toward the Isle of Muck, and the North Channel's going one way and the countercurrent's going the other, and it doesn't really mix very well, does it? No, I mean, say, in some ways you can use the countercurrent because, um, you know, you can make sure that you're using the countercurrent, but... The problem is, you've got this counter current, um, and it just causes all sorts of problems. You get a wall of wa water between the counter current <laughs> and, and your current. I, I think that's a bit over descriptive. You don't get a wall of water, it's not like it's a six foot barrier. <laughs> no, but it's just a lot of water. But if you go like we did, which is about a mile out of the land, uh, you avoid all of that. The locals around here advises that when passing that stretch of water between Blackhead and the Isle of Muck, go out about a mile, mile and a half and stay out there uh, because they know people who have travelled much closer in than that and they've had a nice sail out and the people closer in and getting mashed all over the place. So it's an easy one to avoid. Yes, it looks like you're adding extra miles, but if you don't mind being thumped around, go and stay well in. If you like a nice smooth sail, go out about a mile, mile and a half and it shouldn't be an issue. Hmm. But on the opposite side of the channel to the Gobbins, we have number eight. Which is Port Patrick. And again, it's got a counter current. Um, and um, you really do need to um, fat get your times right. Now, because we didn't. We certainly didn't. Mainly because that was sort of like, I think, our third sail in Salty Lass. <laughs> so. Our thinking was we'd leave at the top of the tide, 
but that's great if you want to go north um, because you'll be going into a north going tidal stream but if you're going south which is what we wanted to do you're going straight into a north going tidal stream and in that part of the world the tide going north is pretty good yeah let's put it this way I mean say in three hours I think they were around for three hours but in three hours we went um, seven it was like seven nautical miles seven nautical miles in three hours because of course you know you're going against the tide we turned around and we did the whole the same journey in 40 minutes yeah we were back in three quarters of an hour but then we had a different problem yeah and that was the fact that the uh, waves had got up so much uh, that going into the entrance, because uh, it's an incredibly narrow entrance. And there's rocks everywhere because there's been jetties and things there over the years and the violence of the sea in that area has literally lifted the jetty up and threw it back onto the beach. Mm. Um, and we talked to some of the locals and they said, go out what's left of the jetty and have a look. You'll see big score marks and you'll see big blocks of granite. and like. They were big blocks, like six feet long. One of uh, them was um, easily sort of like up to my shoulder. That's and the height of it. The sea has just picked it up and just hurled it. And you can see all the score marks as this thing just rolled along the thing. It's mm. it's an incredibly dangerous area if you get it in the wrong weather. Yeah, but um, the RNLI was so good to us. We didn't actually intend to call them out. We just, no. had, we just asked for some assistance on getting in. And next thing, the up turns the blue and orange. Yeah, uh, but we have... Um, because we promised to raise £500 for them. And we've done that. And we have done that. So um, we're really pleased about Thank that. Thank you to everyone who contributed. Um, um, you know, it's it's been wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And it's, it's taken us a while to get there. But like Beverly says, thank you for all of those people who... Um, um contributed to the that rnli fund but i will tell you now uh we have closed it now so that um yeah. you know um i don't know what we'll be doing next but we've closed that indeed not too far from port patrick in distance and also in this particular event not too far in time because port patrick was our third seal on salty lass but on our first seal on salty lass uh, about three or four days previous to the Port Patrick incident, we have number seven, and that's Corsal Point, just off the north of the Mulla Galloway, um, and the area between it and the Ilse Craig. Mm. We didn't appreciate. Um, no, we did not. Because <laughs> the charts don't really show very much, but we've since talked to a lot of people who said, yeah, that area tends to kick off. Yeah. Um, we were having a lovely sail. We were relaxing. We were drinking tea. Um, it was our first day at sea in the boat. Oh, we were so excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were top of the world. We had a boat. We were at sea. The sun was shining. <laughs> and then we passed the Ilsa Creek. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our plan to go to Port Patrick stopped. Yeah, because it uh, the just the seas just kicked up because, as I say, there's in that area... Um, you know, you've got uh, upwellings and things of that nature, and as soon as you get into an upwelling, you're also up up a bit from a headland. And if the, if, if the tide is coming up that way, I'll bet you it whirls and eddies and all sorts. Yeah, of things. that's why there was upwellings and things like that. And there was, you know, once you've got an upwelling, any wind over an upwelling is just like the nightmare. But we did get through it. We did. We wound up at St. Roberts on like one in the morning in a 30 knot crosswind trying to manoeuvre the boat and do a thing for the first day. Oh God, what a night that was. But it was an adventure. Oh and... yeah. <laughs> and it was Gaynor's drowned rat moment. And just for posterity, here it is again. <sighs> well, it's the end of the uh, first day of sailing Salty Lass. And we have had all sorts. We've had beautiful, calm, glorious weather. And as you can see, we have had a howling gale. <laughs> oh dear. Not a million miles from Port Patrick, but once again on the Irish side this time, we have number six. Donica D Sound, or sometimes called Copeland Sound, and it's a little passage to get you into Belfast Lock if you're coming from the south, or if you want to get out of Belfast Lock and go south. Um, it, once again, it's one of those that looks 
pretty tricky on the pilotage. And... It looks really, really skinny. But I can tell you now, in comparison to, say, Calf of Man or um, um, the one we were just talking about at the beginning. Oh, Burnt Burst. Islands. It is huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... The area between the islands is qu and, and the mainland is quite big, but the passage as marked with the voyage isn't particularly wide. It isn't particularly wide, but you're still talking... Um... It's wide enough. On the passage, on, on, on the charts, it looks like you've got a corkscrew round, but really, in reality, you can actually get the boys lined up with each other quite well. And and you can just go through... And you can just run straight through it. Um, it does go a, a fair clip there, oh, yeah. and you can um, get a little bit of uh, speed under your keel, but um, it's in a way it's like a little uh, shot slingshot because you can be whipped through there, and then you're out into the Irish Sea or whipped through there, and you're into Belfast. Look, but um, coming in once um, when we were coming through um, Donegal D Sound. We whipped through there and um, the tide was running um, out at the time and we were running across. So just at the bottom there was a lot of overflows. Yeah, and... basically where, where, where the tide coming through the, the passage met the Irish Sea tide. Yeah, because it was coming, you know. Because it... once again, this is an area where the tide flows in slightly different directions at slightly different times and we just slammed into a lumpy bit. But it was soon over. It was just sort of like a l very lumpy. Um, and I think by the time I'd finished making the cup of tea, it was done. Yeah, and coming the other way, our most recent passage through Donna Cadiz side, we did at one in the morning. Hmm. And we shot through there at about eight knots. And as we came into Belfast Lock, um, we whacked into something. We thought it was water. We thought it was an overfall or something. Uh, but there was a mark on the boat, and I think we might have actually hit something. Okay, well, but at one o'clock in the morning, morning it's, it hard be, it, it's hard to tell. But I, I do know that we whacked into the overflows there, though. Yeah. That was the day we whacked into the overflows. But, again, it's it, it's a lot wider than the pilotage says, and it's a lot simpler than the white pilotage says. But Obviously, still got to be tricky because you've got some good currents. I would say pick the day and pick the weather. Basically, yes. If it's blowing a gale, I would avoid it. And I would try and avoid going through when the tide is running at its worst. Mm. So I'd try and go through near the end of the flood, the end of the ebb, whatever, or the start of either. And preferably with a steady wind that's not too strong. Mm. Definitely. Um, for strong stuff and things like that, then we can go a little further south to number five. Car Carlingford Lock. Now, again, what you're getting here is, and, 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 and you'll notice that there's a, a theme uh, in that the tide is going through a very narrow channel. And as soon as you're going through a very narrow channel, the tide, the, the flow is just going to increase quite a massive Particularly in Carlingford. Carlingford's like the Mersey. You've got a big wide bay mm. and you've got little tiny narrows at Granora Point. Yeah. And all that bay has to fill and empty through that little tiny narrows. Mm. So at the narrows, the tide can be pretty fast. Mm. But um, again, as look, make sure that you're uh, reading your pilotage and that you're going in at the... We typically aim for the last hour of the flood or the ebb for these places. Mm. Because the tide's getting ready to change. It's running slowly. Um... It's just less energy involved. Yeah. And the boat next to us in Carlingford, I'll see if we, I'll see if we took any footage of it. We may have unpublished footage. Um, the, the boat next to us um, had its dinghy davits ripped off because he came in on Wrong. the first hour of the flood. Uh, he came in in the first hour of the ebb. He was coming in against the ebb. Mm. And basically he got turned around a few times, a couple of waves, got filled his dinghy, ripped it off the davits, pulled one of the davits off and tore the dinghy into it. So it's not a good place to get wrong. Mm. And just up from it is number four, a place that everybody warned us about. And it has a terrifying reputation from the pilotage and people's advice. And again, it is because you've got we a very, very narrow channel. We haven't said where number four is yet. Oh, sorry. Number four, Strangford Loch. Yeah, so again, Strangford Lock, it's the fact that you've got this 
big level of water and you've got a very bitty, 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 narrow bit narrow bit to get through it so again you are going to have some pretty hefty tides or, or, or currents going through there there's no shortage of upwellings there's no shortage of luckily we went through little rips and overfalls but you can see where they would be big oh yeah but the main issue that you have with um, Strangford, to be honest, is the fact that the uh, leading lines are not that obvious. So um, mm. it was we classed it as one of our rookie mistakes that we had not put in um, the waypoints and everything into our chart plotter beforehand. No. Because we were having to do everything on compass and... Um, leading line. Leading line. And the... The leading lines are just not that big. No, so a hand compass is not much use to you. You're much better to have binoculars with a compass in. Yes, which we do have. Yeah. Um, but Beverly was uh, telling me what my lines were and things like that. And obviously, there are some lines on the chart, but but there are areas where the lines just disappear on the chart. Mm. So you've got nothing. <laughs> You've just got to use your best judgment at that point. You have. So, um, um, Strangford Marina is... Well, there's no marina in Strangford. It's uh, Port it, of Ferry. It's which Port of is, Ferry has the marina. Um, but ferry gliding is an essential skill there. It is, because the tide runs through the marina at quite a rate. So when you're coming into it, you've got to ferry glide your way into that one. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I tackled it, and, um, you know... You just do it. You just do it. It's just um, as as you're going round places like the Irish Sea, uh, reading charts, learning how to ferry glide, learning how to all, do all these various things, it's just part and parcel of the job, really. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, let's move on. Number three: Fairhead, Torhead, Ballycastle, Rathlin. That whole area up there. Um. I was absolutely about that area. We went with some locals who had made the passage before and we just followed them and followed their lead, didn't we? Uh, also, again, um, that's an area where you can come in. Again, it's very narrow, but basically by coming in, you can avoid some of this. But again, it's one of those areas where so we'll just... that area when you can come in on the inside track yeah we'll just say a little thank you to dave and terry and owen and harris mm. who we all went up with on that particular journey we, we all had separate boats but um you know it was <laughs> it worked out better than we thought well the second half of the journey did we'll talk about the first half of the journey in a couple of minutes yeah but um like i say it was just because there's so much rips and overflows and things like that you know you've got the atlantic coming around that corner and it's being squeezed between scotland and northern ireland and it's got rathlin island sitting in the middle like a big bludgeon and you get eddies and whirlpools and all sorts of things to the east of rathlin mm. so you know like we went through in fair weather but there was there was tons of upwelling there was more upwellings than I've seen anywhere else, which basically means that you, you know, if you get it wrong, yeah. you you'll know you'll, about you'll it. You'll know about it if you get it wrong. One thing it has in common with South Stack, apart from the nasty reputation, is that this is one of these places where an inside passage exists. In mm. fact, it, probably the inside passage is probably the only way to go, to be honest. But mm. we stayed literally about fifty or hundred meters off the shore. Yeah, and even there, there was still a lot of upwelling there was a lot of upwelling but again it's one of those one one areas where yes there is a south uh, uh, an inside track but it doesn't last for long no and don't make the mistake of once you get round for a head thinking you can go out into the bay because if you do when the tide pulls up it'll just push you back around the corner again uh, stay on the inside track mm. the other thing though is um make sure you read your pilotage um for going in and out because going in i think you've got so many hours that you can go in which is sort of, but on the going out you, your time of your window to go out mm. is a lot narrower it's asymmetric it's asymmetric so do read your pilotage on that one mm -hmm. um because i do know that the going out window which we obviously we didn't do no is 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 smaller because from 
that area we went north to Scotland and that takes us to number two. Mm. Doris Moore and the sound of Ling, I think it's pronounced. Look, I'm not good at Scottish Gaelic, so I'm doing my best here. Um, it is one of those areas which, even on a good day, looks bad. Mm. Again, because you've got, you know, you've got a lot of funneling of wind. Because of the way that the islands are and things like that. It's the sea locks, isn't it's it? It's the sea locks. You get a lot of funneling. Mm. But you've got all these islands and they just make beautiful funnels for the wind to come down. And the tide to go against them. It's one of those places you don't want to have push on itis. You know, um, don't think that you've got to go today for some reason or other. If it looks like it's going to be evil out there, stay in, go tomorrow. Mm. It's always tomorrow. Yeah, and that's the only problem though, is sometimes when you think, oh, it looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. Anyway, uh. Uh, once we've gone to Scotland, we had to come back to Northern Ireland. So that meant we had to face number one again. And number one is our northern nemesis. We've got Chicken Rock in the south and in the north we have the North Channel. Um, the main reason that the North Channel can be um, treacherous is um, you've got just an awful lot of water going up and down it. You have. You've got an awful lot of water and it likes to go up and down it at some ferocious speed like three or four knots everywhere. Yeah. And if you get the wind against that and you you know, you may do for six hours at a time. Uh, it can be a nightmare. The day we went to Bally Castle, um, we went with the locals and everything was going peachy until we turned the corner and went into the North Channel and then we got absolutely slammed with a 30 knot headwind and a four or five knot tide going the other way. And um, one of the uh, other boats in the, con on, in the convoy actually commented that he could see our keel on a couple of occasions. Now, I'm not being funny. Seeing keels... Not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Especially when the boat is more or less upright. We came off one wave there and I thought that was the day we had broke the boat's back. Mm. Uh, we hit so hard I thought we'd wrecked the boat. So the upshot is that that area, that one trip early on in our sailing career, I think it's mentally scarred us and ever since then when we've had to cross the North Channel we wait for weather don't we? Yeah and uh, since then we have gone over the North Channel quite a few times right. and I can tell you now we have chosen no wind whatsoever on all of them. <laughs> I don't think we actually chose it. I think it just happened that way. But we've seen the weather window come up. Oh, look, there's going to be no wind. We can cross the channel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we've sat around somewhere to have had the clearance and then we've gone. Yeah, but the thing is, it does mean that we've moved today a few times now. I'm happy with that. <laughs> but it's just um, purely the tide can be going, it can yeah. be whapping and it's whatever. Yeah. So that's our top 10 in this area and we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you got some useful tips out of it. Uh, any questions, put them in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer them. See, See you! you. <laughs>